Hi, in this video, we will work through one of the problems in chapter 5 covering electrostatics. While this isn't a complex question, in order to answer all these questions, especially part C, you need to review some things that you learned in trigonometry. I think this is a good question to use to review those formulas and concepts from classes uh, some semesters years ago. So let me uh, do parts A and B, even though they are easier, uh, as a way of introduction. So let me first uh, draw the picture to make sure that I didn't miss anything in reading of the question. It says two charges plus four microcoulomb. Uh, let me give them a label and just uh, stick with that label. So the first charge I'm going to call Q1. Second charge I'm going to call Q2. So I have two charges, Q1 and Q2. They are placed along the x-axis with uh, Q1 at origin and Q2. It gives me the position, let me just call this x naught. It asks for magnitude and direction of the net force on a minus 2 nanocoulomb. Let me call that capital Q charge when placed at the following locations below. All right, it looks like it's going to break up into three different questions. So let me make a space for those three questions. Here's the space for A with those two charges drawn. Here's B with the same two charges. And here's C with, again, same two charges. So for A, it says charge Q is at the halfway point between the two charges. So it's at a distance D away from each of the charges Q1 and Q2. And you want to think through what kind of forces on charge Q due to those two charges. As a reminder from the numbers that I saw earlier, Q1 and Q2 are both positive and the Q was negative. So there is going to be attractive force on test charge Q from the two charges Q1 and Q2. And these are the forces. Now, we might not explicitly label it that way each time, but what I am drawing here is a free body diagram, diagram of forces. So the net force is the sum of these two forces. Let me make the positive x direction positive, so it's going to be F2 minus F1. For the magnitudes of these two forces, you use Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law says that the electric force between the two charges is proportional to the product of those two charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. And uh, to make it an equality, there's Coulomb's constant multiplying in front to make the units come out right and give the correct magnitude for the electric force. So it looks like uh, all the info necessary information is given. So let me write out this expression and See if I can simplify it and, and end it where you can just plug in the numbers and finish it. So F2, the force due to the charge Q2 is the Coulomb constant times Q2 times Q divided by the distance squared, in this case D here. And we subtract F1, force from charge Q1, Coulomb constant times Q1 times the test charge divided by d, again, d squared. It looks like I can simplify quite a bit, so let me do that. I can factor out all these common factors here. And when I do, I have Coulomb constant times the test charge divided by d squared, and the difference between the two charges, q2 minus q1. Okay, I th think you have all the numbers for the quantities here. So the rest is a matter of plugging the numbers. Make sure you watch the unit, convert your answer to millinewtons. For the direction, we can actually answer that a little bit here. You can see that the whole quantity here will be positive if charge Q2 is greater than Q1. And for the numbers I got up above, that happens to be the case. So direction of the net force will be in the positive x direction. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, now we are at part B. Uh, let me make the necessary changes here. This is the case where the test charge Q 
is not at the midpoint between them, but at x equals minus 0 0.5 meters. Okay, I need to extend it out a little bit. Okay, it seems significant that this location is negative, so let me label it this way. x equals minus x1 and move the charge. All right, let me erase a few things that don't apply anymore and start working through this question. We start at the same place we did for part A. We look at the forces. The relative signs of the charges remain the same, which means the force will still be attractive. So let me draw the free body diagram. The force from charge Q1 is in the positive x direction, and so is the force from charge Q2. They may not be the same magnitude, I'm just indicating directions here. So because of where the test charge Q is now, this time, the attractive force from Q1 and Q2 will happen to point in the same direction. So let me write down the net force equation net force is going to be F1 plus F2. And this time, before I do any more work, I know what direction force will be. It'll be to the right, or plus x direction. Ah, but in thinking about writing down Coulomb's law and looking at the distances, I see that there's one thing I do have to be careful. The distances are different. D1 is going to be x1 and the distance d2 is going to be, you have to work out the math, looking at the geometry, it looks like it'll be x0 plus x1. So when you plug in the numbers for the distances, you will have to watch out for these different numbers. I'll indicate that with the different symbols d2 and d1 when I'm writing out the expression. So the expression, applying Coulomb's law, f1 is Coulomb constant times charge times the test charge divided by the distance squared, d1 squared, plus f2 is Coulomb constant times the charge q2 times the test charge divided by d2 squared. And we can do a little bit of simplification here. It doesn't simplify quite as much as it did the last time. I can factor out the common factors Coulomb constant and the test charge, but the rest uh, remain separated. You'll just have to do the work on the calculator to plug in all these numbers. All the numerical quantities here, they are numbers you can find from the information given in the problem statement, including this geometric thing that we looked at. And as before, uh, watch the units and convert your answer to millinewtons. And this time, this will be greater than zero no matter what, as long as this relationship here holds, that the test charge was negative and the charges Q1 and Q2 are positive. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, this is part C. Looking at the question description at the coordinate x, y equals this point, I find that, oh, there's a y-axis here. So this is going to be a two-dimensional problem. So it'll take a, quite a bit of more consideration. There is a hint for the question, and do take a look at it. You have to treat each force as a vector quantity, and you have to add the components together and use that result to, to calculate the magnitude and the direction. It's a full vector exercise, and that's why I think this will be a good problem to review. Okay, so let me go through what this hint suggests. Let me get rid of the things that don't apply anymore. And let me move this uh, figure down a bit so that I have room to mark the place where charge Q will be. I think that's enough room, so let me move charge Q to the place where it's supposed to be. We do these particular numbers, the Y coordinate seems to be half of X coordinate, but I don't know if that's always going to be. So let me write this generally with the X coordinate X naught. I hope that's on purpose and the y coordinate um, x2. I do think the question will be quite a bit more complicated if uh, the test charge is directly above one of the two charges. So I think the x coordinate is meant to be the same as at least one of the two charges. Oh, in fact, the question actually describes that straight out. All right, the steps here are surprisingly consistent. There are some things to watch out for here. 
So let me start by drawing the free body diagram. The charge Q1 applies an attractive force along this dotted line that I've drawn. So let me draw a force that points towards Q1 along a line similar to that on the free body diagram. That's F1. And charge Q2 applies a directly downward force. So let me label that F2. So from here, you can follow the hint given, which is to break these forces into components, add the components, and work with those components. That's the exact way you would treat this question in Physics 4A. And I think uh, everyone watching this video knows how to do that. So let me use this uh, opportunity to introduce you to using vector notation. This is a more formal approach. And frankly, for this question, using this approach will take more time than it would otherwise. But I think uh, it's an approach worth learning. The general formulas in physics tend to be written in these formal notations so that they are generally applicable and not be dependent on definition of coordinate axis and all that stuff. So let me leave off the hint and, and use the vector notation. This is where I need to modify how I wrote Coulomb's law. So Coulomb's law is a vector law. It describes force, which is a vector quantity, and it gives the direction in terms of the unit vector r. This unit vector r, it points from source, so in the way I've been using the lowercase q, to the charge which is filling the force, in this case uppercase q. Depending on notation, those two might be reversed. What's uh, important here is that it's from the source of the force to the target of the force, if that's the right word. Let me draw those uh, unit vectors here as a way of explanation. So the charge q1 here, the unit vector for the force from q1 would point along this line towards the test charge q. So this is the r1 hat unit vector. And the unit vector for the force from Q2 would point in this direction, R2 hat. Now, if you are perplexed because those two directions appear to be opposite of the direction of the force we've been working with, no worries, I will get to that. Let me make some space for all the equations I'm going to be writing down. Okay, so the equation we are writing down is the same net force equation that we've used before. Net force is equal to F1 plus F2. That hasn't changed. What we have to take care to express now is the fact that these are vector quantities. So when we write down these vector quantities, Ke Q1 test charge Q divided by D1 squared, I have to remember that's the magnitude and that I have to multiply this by the unit vector in order to retain that vector properly. Okay, plus the F2, KQ2, test the charge Q divided by D2 squared, R2 hat. Oh, and let me label D1 and D2 so that I keep track of what quantity is what. So the natural question that you would have looking at this is, what do we do with those? <laughs> I hope you resist the temptation to simply add them because R1 hat and R2 hat are different. You can't just add them. So what we usually end up doing when we are dealing with these unit vectors that can point in any arbitrary direction, we do define and work with a coordinate axis. This question already defined an x and y axis for us. So let's just continue using that. One of the two unit vectors are expressed quite simply. I can see here that R2 hat is Y hat. Nothing complicated. It's the way to approach R1 hat that I want you to review. These unit vectors are best thought of as representing a point on the unit circle. I hope you remember unit circle, I think from trigonometry. And these coordinates on the unit circle are expressed this way. Cosine theta for x component and sine theta for y component, where 
theta is expressed as the angle from the positive x-axis going counterclockwise. And as you might remember from trigonometry, this expression here is actually valid for all values of theta. It can be greater than 90 degrees. It can even be greater than 360 degrees if you go more than one full circle around. So we do that understanding in mind. The general formula for these unit vectors in terms of the unit vectors along the direction of x and y, x hat and y hat, is this. So along the x hat direction, the magnitude of the component is cosine theta. And along the y hat direction, the magnitude of the component is the sine theta. So this is the formula that we will use to express r1 hat in terms of x hat and y hat. Let me write that out in the expression for the net force. So I have the same magnitude as before, and now I'm going to write R1 hat into those components. X hat times cosine theta plus Y hat times sine theta. And we will handle that expression for theta in a bit. Oh, and uh, here's the expression for F2. Once again, if the lack of um, downward direction, because you know the force is downward, if that lack uh, concerns you, don't worry, we will handle that. Okay, now we can collect like terms here. By terms, I mean terms in terms of x hat and y hat. So I'm going to collect all, all the terms according to if it has x hat in it or y hat in it. Those will be your x component and y component, actually. So the term with x hat is, oh, I guess there's only one term. Ke q1 q over d1 squared times cosine theta. So as soon as we handle what that cosine theta is, we are done with the x component. And the term with y hat is, I have two terms this time, Ke q1 q d1 squared times the sine theta and the f2 k q2 q over d2 squared all right let's uh, take a stock of what we know uh, this might be the step where we, we will be plugging in numbers numerically because there's no real further simplification from here you know the coulomb's constant the values of the charges so what we need to make sure that we have are the distances and this uh, quantity that describes the direction. So let's just write those out. I think D2 is pretty clear from this uh, representation here that the distance D2 is just our x2, the y coordinate given. D1 is a little bit more complicated. You have to think of this triangle here. It's a right triangle, thankfully. <laughs> and looking at it, it looks like we are given the two legs. Or another way to describe this is we are given the two coordinate values, so, and D is just the magnitude. So using Pythagorean theorem, we get D1 should be equal to square root of x naught squared plus x2 squared. So for these, I think I'm just going to plug in the numbers and handle these as a numerical quantities. That just leaves us to deal with theta, or more specifically, cosine theta and sine theta. Because I want to introduce here a technique that you will see in a later problem solving, and you may find it useful even in more advanced problem solving in the future. Let me make a little space to explain that technique. The technique is named drawing the triangle. It's a descriptive name because what I am going to do is I'm going to draw the triangle. So the theta that we are dealing with here, it's part of a right triangle. So let me draw that right triangle here. Now, when I have that representation of the triangle, I know from the geometric values given in the problem that one of the legs is x naught, the other leg is x2. And what this technique, drawing the triangle, refers to 
is that once you have these parameters that fully represent the triangle, it fully specifies it, there's no free parameter remaining, then we can label all the sides of the triangle. In fact, I can label the hypotenuse using the Pythagorean theorem. Then we have all the information we need to figure out all the trigonometric quantities just to, with the quantities that are here in this drawing. We don't have any need to find the theta itself. If we, in the end, all we want are cosine theta and sine theta, that information is already here. We don't have to find the theta itself. We see that sine theta is the opposite over the hypotenuse. So I can write down sine theta is x2 over square root of x0 squared plus x2 squared. And cosine theta is adjacent over the hypotenuse. So cosine theta is equal to x0 over square root of x0 squared plus x2 squared. Now, in this question, it doesn't quite simplify. You could combine this with d1 to simplify it a little bit, but the payoff there isn't that big. So for this question, what you will use this is to plug in numbers x2 and x0 here to get some numerical value for sine theta, get some numerical value for cosine theta, and plug those in here. So it's a bit of an overkill, but I want you to introduce this technique here so that in the places where you need it, where it's not an overkill, it's not the first time you are seeing it. So I think with that, you have all the numbers you need to calculate this combined quantity here. Those two, uh, it takes calculator work. It takes quite a bit of time. So I won't do that on video. Um, what I will point out is that for the magnitude of the force, this should be square root of the first number squared plus the second number. That's the Pythagorean theorem. Make sure you watch the units, convert that to millinewtons. And for the direction, oh, I will address this in more detail, maybe in a different setting. Um, for this particular question, if you happen to put in arctangent of the second number, y component, divide by the first number, x component. That'll give you a correct answer. I just want to highlight that it's correct because of how the question words the directions. Uh, depending on the question description of the direction, you may have to figure out what quadrant the vector is in and do all that stuff. But I'll leave that off for a different setup. So that's all for this question. It's a quite a bit of detail to work through. It will take you some amount of time to work through. And I want you to look at this as a preview of quantitative problem solving you need to do in electromagnetism and review the topics that you have learned in the past that you might have forgotten. Until next time, bye. Oh, and I almost forgot. <laughs> On the matter of the direction, between these unit vectors and the force vectors. When you calculate these numbers, watch out for the sign of these charges. So charge Q1 is a positive number. Test charge Q is a negative number. So when you pay attention to that sign, this overall quantity should be a negative number. And the same thing goes for this overall quantity it should be a negative number. That negative sign for the component reverses the direction of these unit vectors and make the forces point in the correct direction. And in general, this is how Coulomb's law handles the direction of the force. This full expression is meaningful, including the direction. And that's why this specification of direction is important. When the unit vector is specified this way, it makes it so that when these two charges have the same sign, the force is repulsive because this direction of unit vector makes the force point away from the source. And when the sign of these two charges are different, that makes the force attractive mathematically.
Okay, so <laughs> I think that's everything. This time for real. Until next time. Bye.